Marx's theory of history is often mischaracterized as a reductive linear model. We are often presented with an understanding of Marx's historical analysis as one that is intrinsically deterministic, economistic, and teleological. A cursory review of Marx's theory of history may very well reveal a simplistic, predictable approach. However, upon closer inspection, it is anything but. The issue that we inevitably run into with framing Marx's conception of historical development is that Marx never produced a systematic theory of history. He simply exercised his methods in the pages of his works. It is from this practice that others have drawn their interpretations of Marx's theory of history. The lack of explicit theoretical works on Marx's part is compounded by the interpretations that have indeed fitted Marx's impressionistic construction of historical development into concrete laws and an immutably deterministic structure. Though you likely won't encounter many arguments that adopt an openly linear and reductive model, the specter of determinism continues to haunt this field of Marxist thought. Setting aside the very pertinent and potentially fruitful debate on whether Marxists ought to shy away from the determinism in the first place, we will consider here a reading of Marx that challenges reductive interpretations. In particular, we will consider Marx's theory of transitions, since, arguably, it is at a crucial junction between the modes of production where history truly occurs. There are several noteworthy passages throughout Marx's works that indicate a specific refutation of economism. Economism is the form of determinism which relegates primary agency to the economy and the social elements related to it. The charge being mounted against Marx is that his analysis and conclusions place the importance of the economy above all other spheres of society. The economic structure dictated, for example, the types of political systems that were possible in a given mode of production. However, even in their own lifetimes, both Marx and Engels were visibly guarded about the accusations of determinism. In a letter to J. Block, Engels stated the following, According to the materials conception of history, the ultimately determining element in history is the production and reproduction of real life. Other than this, neither Marx nor I have ever asserted. Hence, if somebody twists this into saying that the economic element is the only determining one, he transforms that proposition into a meaningless, abstract, senseless phrase. The economic situation is the basis, but the various elements of the superstructure, political forms of the class struggle and its results, to wit, constitutions established by the various classes after a successful battle, etc., juridical forms, and even the reflexes of all these actual struggles in the brains of the participants, political, juristic, philosophical theories, religious views, and their further development into systems of dogmas, also exercise their influence upon the course of the historical struggles and in many cases preponderate in determining their form. This is an overt defense against reductive interpretations, but it comes from angles well after Marx's death. Did Marx himself develop such a position, and if so, where can it be found in his work? We will need to build our answer to this question in layers. First, is there a linear progression in Marx's theory of historical transitions? Let's consider this passage from chapter 36 of volume 3 of Capital. Both of these things, the ruining of rich landed proprietors by usury and the impoverishment of the small producers, led to the formation and concentration of large money capitals. But the extent to which this process abolishes the old mode of production, as was the case in modern Europe, and whether it establishes the capitalist mode of production in its place, depends entirely on the historical level of development and the conditions that this provides. There are a couple crucial elements here. Marx seems to imply that the development of the capitalist mode of production, and indeed any new mode of production, is not a predetermined outcome. The abolition of the old mode of production and the establishment of a new mode of production is not a given, but rather depends on several historical factors. Thus, the formation of a new mode of production cannot rely on a single socio-economic dynamic, though each component of the economy and society can play a key role in the establishment of the conditions necessary for the transition. Furthermore, Marx's emphasis on modern Europe indicates that the development of modes of production are not universal, and that what has been observed in Europe is merely one of many possible paths. The case of modern Europe is a parenthetical inserted in an already contingent proposition. Europe happened to develop the way that it did based on specific historical circumstances that may well have played out differently. In chapter 47 of volume 3, Marx lays out even more explicitly the variability of base and superstructure configurations. 
the specific economic form in which unpaid surplus labor is pumped out of the direct producers determines the relationship of domination and servitude, as this grows directly out of production itself and reacts back on it in turn as a determinant. On this is based the entire configuration of the economic community arising from the actual relations of production, and hence also its specific political form. This does not prevent the same economic basis, the same in its major conditions, from displaying endless variations and gradations in its appearance, as the result of innumerable different empirical circumstances, natural conditions, racial relations, historical influences acting from outside, etc. And these can only be understood by analyzing these empirically given conditions. In the first part of this passage, Marx shows us that the economic paradigm frames the social relations of production, but also that these in turn react back on the economy. In the second part, Marx speaks of the endless variations and gradations that can be produced within the framework established by the economic structure. These variations depend on a myriad of factors, including historical influences acting from outside, which attribute a degree of extraneous casualty to Marx's model, at least on the national or regional level. Such variations, Marx argues, can only be understood by studying the specificity of given circumstances. Having established the flexibility of Marx's theory, we ought to now consider the actual dynamics of transition. How do modes of production transition from one to another? What Marx appears to hint at, in certain passages, is the combination of continuity and disruption. We often picture, and rightfully so, the transition from one mode of production to another as a rupture. However, it is not necessarily a rupture in form, but in function. In other words, certain elements of dynamics existing in the old mode of production pass into the new, but their function within the context of the new totality is radically altered. In this passage from chapter 20 of volume 3, Marx argues that commercial capital, already present before the advent of capitalism, underwent a transformation of function during the transitionary phase. Within the capitalist mode of production, i.e. once capital takes command of production itself and gives it a completely altered and specific form, commercial capital appears simply as capital in a particular function. In all earlier modes of production, however, commercial capital rather appears as a function of capital par excellence, and the more so, the more production is directly the production of the producer's means of subsistence. Commercial capital not only existed before capitalism, but was the primary manifestation of capital. Marx focuses on the path commercial capital took in its pre-capitalist function to its position within the capitalist mode of production. The passage of commercial capital from the pre-capitalist to the capitalist mode of production is characterized by its subjugation to a new economic structure, one where industrial capital is a central paradigm. Commercial capital is now a component of a larger process. Its functions pertain to the larger process, and though it has a history of its own, its history within the capitalist mode of production refers specifically to the distributive role it plays for industrial capital. In this sense, transition between modes of production is a radical reconfiguration of the functions of various social, economic, and political components. However, we have still not answered how such a transition can come to be. What is the motor that ultimately prompts this reconfiguration of elements? It is the movement of the elements themselves, the friction and reorientation of their parts that produces the conditions for change. In the same chapter, Marx writes, In the stages that preceded capitalist society, it was trade that prevailed over industry. In modern society, it is the reverse. Trade naturally reacts back to a greater or lesser extent on the communities between which it is pursued. It subjects production more and more to exchange value by making consumption and existence more dependent on sale than on the direct use of the product. In this way, it dissolves the old relationships. It increases monetary circulation. It no longer just takes hold of surplus production, but gradually gobbles up production itself and makes entire branches of production dependent on it. This solvent effect, however, depends very much on the nature of the community of producers. Trade, like commercial capital, had a distinct function in pre-capitalist conditions. However, in interacting with other components, trade exacerbated the points of friction between a multitude of contradictions. The steady dissolution of segments of the old configuration began to shape conditions for radical transformation. What is critical here, however, is that no one contradiction or component is primarily responsible for setting up an atmosphere of transition. Marx discusses money rent later in Volume 3 with precisely the same implications as his analysis of trade. In its further development, money rent must lead, leaving aside all intermediate forms, such as that of the small peasant farmer, either to the transformation of the land into free peasant property or to the form of the capitalist mode of production, rent paid by the capitalist farmer. 
This echoes the first passage on rent we examined in chapter 36, where a component of the current mode of production comes into conflict with other components, producing a tension and a shifting balance that sets the stage for systemic alteration. Here, again we are faced with a contingency of transition, suggesting that even where these tensions coagulate, they are in themselves not sufficient to carry forward a systemic transformation. More examples of the multiplicity of abolishing factors can be found in Marx's passing premonitions regarding the transition past capitalism. Interestingly enough, Marx identifies the credit system as one element that would carry with it a transformative property. For Marx, credit eases the circuits of capital and accelerated its accumulation, thereby accelerating both the frequency and the intensity of economic crashes. The credit system hence accelerates the material development of the productive forces and the creation of the world market, which it is the historical task of the capitalist mode of production to bring a certain level of development as material foundations for the new form of production. At the same time, credit accelerates the violent outbreaks of this contradiction, crises, and with these elements of dissolution of the old mode of production. Marx was clearly fascinated with the credit system's potential to transform the conditions of capitalism. There can be no doubt that the credit system will serve as a powerful level in the course of transition from the capitalist mode of production to the mode of production of associated labor. However, only as one element in connection with other large-scale organic revolutions in the mode of production itself. As indicated above, Marx did not attribute a disproportionate weight to credit alone. He persistently described the complexity of transition. He saw similar potential in the banking system, which he argued could contribute to the gradual abolition of private capital by continuously socializing its ownership. The idea that the different social structures possess a relative autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the system as a whole was famously articulated by Louis Althusser and his students. Etienne Balibar, in his section on the basic concepts of historical materialism, of reading capital, lays out the idea of correspondence and non-correspondence. Transitionary modes of production are characterized by the presence of multiple modes of production, a multitude of synchronies. Moreover, since they do not develop uniformly, the forms within a transitionary mode of production are in a state of non-correspondence. The legal and political forms, for example, do not correspond with the economic form. This disjunction is what indicates the transition. The path to capitalism was not univariate. It required the alignment of several conditions which developed fairly independently of each other and did not necessarily originate from the same place. The origin of money capital is located in a different space than the origin of labor power, both of which were not sufficient conditions on their own to bring about the capitalist mode of production. With that, we are now equipped with the basic understanding of Marx's theory of transitions. The debates surrounding Marx's theory of history, in the broadest sense, are not conclusive and warrant further investigation. As such, what we have discussed here is more accurately described as a Marxist theory of transitions, meaning it is not the only one, nor does it necessarily put an end to debates on the topic. In summary, though Marx never spelled out his theory of history, there is ample evidence in his works that suggest a nonlinear and minimally deterministic model. In numerous places, Marx not only acknowledged the complexity of historical development, but insisted on a heterogeneous and modular system. Even if the economic paradigms establish structural limits to the social formation as a whole, the system is defined by all of its parts which are in a state of constant interaction with one another. Thank you for watching this video. Feel free to leave your thoughts and questions in the comment section below. And until next time, remember, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it.